At a marine research lab, Reina and Megumi deliver a sample from a creature for analysis, only to learn it's a mutant form through radioactive tests, meaning we are dealing with a Godzilla scenario. But not one formed from sea-based nuclear detonations, but from underground nuclear testing whose fallout was released in a recent series of earthquakes. Okay, one. No one in Japan is stupid enough to do underground nuclear testing considering how much of the country is tectonically active and doing that can set off earthquakes to begin with. Not like they'd be able to as two. Despite Japan's status as a de facto nuclear state and the ability to construct them if the need arises, they don't have any nuclear munitions to test as the episode infers. They don't want any. This, however, is intended as a bit of socio-political commentary, as there's this thing called the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, meant to ban all nuclear testing in all environments, that's been around since 1996, but has not been able to be enforced because eight of the required nations put it into law by the UN have refused to ratify it, including the United States. This thing has been trying to get passed for 20 years. Yeah, I can understand them calling upon Godzilla allegory for this one. I think it's a bit more important than that stupid Trans-Pacific partnership that unilaterally screws people over. Anyways, the monster created from this recent radiation release, radioactive mutations don't work that fast even if it did work that way, starts attacking oil platforms a la Cloverfield, necessitating Guts go back to their rescue team role to save the workers, before being reluctantly ordered by Sawai to hunt down this beast of their own creation. Which is easy, as the giant fish is massively radioactive! That can't be good! However, they come to realize that this fish is being drawn by sound waves, and due to the Marine Lab's testing of a new sonic device, they're ultimately the next target, Daigo going ultra-live to prevent the center's destruction. This fight is horrifically comedic and out of step with the tone of the rest of the episode, especially the sight gags pulled all along the fight. Oh, and there's this subplot about Reina becoming friends with a dolphin named Mio, which the subs of course mistranslated. At night, an alien miniaturizes and captures humans, the axe being seen by a kid named Shinichi, who is a cousin to Shinjo. He calls into Guts to report the incident, and they... actually believe him? My god, it's a series of events that's consistent with the main cast characterization as intelligent, as they actually correlate this to other reports of mysterious disappearances instead of writing it off! CELEBRATION! Unfortunately, Shinichi is not as smart, as he tails the aliens, called Raybeaks, which ends up with him eventually being abducted despite Shinjo's efforts. Still, with data from the exchanges, Hori manages to whip something up which will protect the team, as they track down the aliens to an abandoned warehouse where they've set up shop. This is the episode infamous for that you'll be bigger than Pokemon line in the 4Kids dub, and here's where we actually have to address how offensive that actually was. Yeah, I'll keep this brief, as there's a lot more one could deconstruct about this. The Raybeaks are abducting people to turn them into slaves, because the actual slave race they rely upon is dying out, and humans are very similar to them. The 4Kids dub changed this into humans being collectibles, cheap-costing items bought and sold at inflated prices because they hold some abstract value and are otherwise worthless. Slaves have worth as a resource for getting jobs done. Collectibles must have value imposed upon them. Slaves are considered to be sentient beings, but those who come to own them or enslave them themselves don't really care as long as their work is completed. Collectibles are and shall always be toys, and to be a toy is to be considered non-sentient and non-sapient. You're just a thing if you are a collectible. To consider a sentient being nothing but a toy is worse than treating someone as a slave. While it makes the beings more villainous, it ultimately removes the entirety of the gray and divergent moralities of the situation, and that this is a different culture being forced into a situation that necessitates this which puts them in opposition to our heroes, and also not only makes it more petty in that this is the shallow reason they are performing these abductions, but misrepresents and then misassociates the act of slavery 
down to the derogatory notion of just collecting things for no reason. Yeah, this is yet again a can't-justify-doing-this-for-kids incident, as other children's programs at that time and before that actually addressed the whole slavery is bad message. Hell, I was learning about that in the freaking first grade. To say nothing about how America has a worse relation with slavery than other developed nations as we were one of the last to abandon such a notion, and our racial stigmas relating to it have lasted long past its end, which makes it whitewashing all the worse. Anyways, Hori delivers gun cartridges that shoot energy-disrupting fields, which allows them to infiltrate and save the victims, while also showcasing Daigo once again transform into a human-sized Ultraman, initially perpetrated by the Raybeak's miniaturization guns, but then showcasing a complete control over whether the being is macro or micro at will, which is a pretty clever showcasing of an absolute counter, and the stunt work with Tiga honestly feeling like something that'd be from Keita Amamiya earlier in his career mainly as the fight works closer to how Sentai, Ryder, and Garo tends to work. It ends with destruction of their ship to prevent them from informing their home world of human life, and thus are never seen again. I guess the problem facing their world is over there, and over there has to take care of itself. Another craft crashes to the ground, showcasing a woman with a chained bracelet on her arm. She eventually runs into the Guts team after an alien comes after her, actively hunting her down. Though you probably could have guessed that on your own, if you were at all familiar with the Yajuta from Predator. But let's face it, they were not going to get the extensive animatronics for the Yajuta's face mandibles on a half-hour weekly TV show's budget. While the woman, named Lucia, is taken in by Guts, she has a companion named Zara that the alien, Muzan, then prioritizes eliminating instead, Lucia trying to rush to her companion's aid by giving Guts the slip but it only leads to her death, the team in Tiga dealing with the alien after their attacks force it into the macro scale. Though I have to say, this thing's monster form is wonderfully abstract in its design, with its head and spinal column attached in such a way that can act as a tail. It's very intriguing to me. Episode 15, however, is the first of the callback event episodes that form what little continuity the show has calling back to both episodes 6 and 10 for its story. The Storm Cloud Critters return again, feasting on the power from all kinds of electrical devices, one of which happens to be a Trans-Pacific airliner en route to Japan, which carries Mayumi's fiancé inside of it. Because of these critters' more rampant feasting of electrical energy, this second entity is far stronger, and it interferes with their ability to analyze it as anything electromagnetic sent at it is suddenly being absorbed. As Mayumi was en route to meet her fiancé at the time, she's right in the monster's path of attack, her electric car dying completely. Or at least that's my reasoning, as something draining or disrupting electrical power should not affect an engine that runs on combustion, as the systems required to keep the spark bug inciting the combustion require such little energy after startup that they supposedly can keep running through an EMP. The sad thing is, I would vastly have preferred this monster over the nonsense they got pulled in Godzilla 2014. And at least there's fucking human characterization throughout the entire story instead of that all dying out and turning everyone into idiots past Brian Cranston dying. Still, she's in the danger zone, so Guts plans to disrupt the monster's power drain with a microwave emitter. A microwave being a form! of electromagnetic radiation, which the monster is currently absorbing on all bands and spectrums. But in the midst of this, a mysterious biker comes out of nowhere to save Mayumi's life! And it's her... fiancé Takuma? The hell? How the fuck did he get off the plane? I demand an explanation! <laughs> Uh, yes it does, and that is not an explanation for this phenomena. You guys are a science-based organization. Your job is to quantify supernatural phenomena. You are supposed to explain things with science. The only explanation they give is he's a ghost, but that's not really legitimate, as this entity has shown little commonality to the other creatures that did this earlier, as that was based off of assimilation and then projection. This monster could care less about any of that. 
Ugh. Speaking of supernatural phenomena, three thieves stumble across an abandoned shrine and pilfer both a statue of an ancient samurai and his sword, one known for in his time for fighting monsters. The removal of such leads to one of the monsters he fought awakening in pieces, as he buried all of the parts he cut up across the landscape. Only, for some inexplicable reason, all the pieces are now on the macro scale, so then breaking out piece by piece initially baffles the Guts team, as each of the holes are far too small for the monster scaling they've come to expect. Lampshading of thematic consistency? You're soaking in it! Yeah, even when the show gets stupid, on average there's still an air of intelligence to the characters, and it's frustrating that I have to point it out as a merit after some of the last major toku reviews I've done, where casts act like fucking imbeciles. However, this is where the episode heads south again, in that when one of the thieves begins to have second thoughts about stealing from a shrine, he becomes possessed by the spirit of the samurai, Kagatatsu, who sends the awakening of this demon. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you kind of did. To not strike to cut means you use the flat or bladeless side of the sword to strike at them. You cut his clothing. If you meant did not strike to kill or did not strike to wound, then you wouldn't be selling yourself as hypocritical. As I've kind of addressed elsewhere, I'm not big on stories where a supposed good guy forcibly takes possession of another's body against the will of the host. There are only two types of stories possession can be used as a story device in them, where it equates to a form of symbiosis, or something beneficial comes from it, and one that has always been considered to be allegorical to rape and similar violating abuse. Tales like this tread dangerously close to that borderline between them, in that the possessor has a good reason to do it, but they're still going against the will of the body to do so. To say nothing of the problem of this being a mystical creature, when Ultraman villains are expected to be of the extraterrestrial, forgotten world, or science variety. It's not the first to do so, mind you, it's just thematically it seems out of place. I'm saying this about a series whose writing staff is helmed by a guy infamous for injecting Lovecraft into everything he works on, where I'm supposed to expect that kind of overarching supernatural influence as opposed to a preternatural one. Anyways, Kagatatsu attacks Daigo as he senses something inhuman about him, but upon realizing that inhuman aspect is benign, he informs him of the situation and the demon's reassembly, and assists him in battle against it as solely the sword which is the only thing that allows Tiga to win against it. And as to why I said this was a borderline case of the bad possession, the wrap-up does more mediate my issue with it, as the criminal Kagatatsu possessed found the experience to be a enlightening one, convincing him to turn his life around, while passing on some of the samurai's words about the duty and loneliness of a warrior. We have another case of an alien abducting people, but this time it happens to be a variety of those with talent in athletic pursuits, and an actor. Another alien confronts him, becoming wounded from the act, before being taken in by, of all things, an old woman, which allows him to recover its power. These two aliens are from the same world and race, the Standel, but are of opposing tribes, one living on the light side of the world, and the other the dark side, as each is weakened by the opposite environment. The abducting alien, a Bulbus, part of the nocturnal tribe, and the one saved by the woman, Redel, aligned with the Light Tribe. Both sides are in the middle of a war, and much like a Bulbus, Rettle was here for much the same reason, to recruit proxies in their war who can function during both the day and night, when their opposing tribe would be at their weakest, for if they don't... The night will last forever! <laughs> I get the implication from this episode that the war has been going on for a long time for them to resort to such measures as being shown kindness from the old woman ends up awakening a level of compassion from the alien, who seeks to return the favor the following day when she ends up accosted by punks. This, of course, leads to a report which gets back to Guts, who think the woman's been taken hostage, and the expected humor of a scenario like this would entail. They decide to help it, if only to get them off the planet and recover their hostages, 
and stage a fight between their members, which results in half the team being abducted. Daigo confronts a Balbus, who tries to give the recruitment speech you'd expect, but Rettle passes on a Balbus' weakness, which is super effective as one who shines in the darkness. That reminds me, I need to get back to reviewing Garo this year. Still, Riddle leaves on good terms to continuing fighting his people's war, with Earth kept straight out of it. Deep into the winter season, Kiriamon Peak experiences a massive and sudden volcanic eruption, and Guts is reassigned back to their rescue team duties to divert the magma flu- Wait, no, they're not doing that. Dr. Kashimura su instead suggests tunneling into the volcano to freeze it. Yeah, that doesn't work that way. So, the tunnel into the mountain plant isn't an intrinsically awful one if you're giving such magma an outlet to travel into the sea, or at the very least along a path which won't cross populated regions. Since they do have a drill tank that can do the job, called Peeper, which, as mentioned before, is a vehicle whose name was changed in the subs, which was changed to the Weevil, but anyways, they deploy in the tank, but once inside the volcano, they find it's populated by Golza the kaiju that escaped the opening battle. Since it's fled, it's been living down here, and grown stronger from the exposure to an absorption of the thermal energy. However, Shinjo, following the reckless aspect of his character, fires on the beast, which is far from the smartest of moves as it wakes the creature up. Whoops. Still, despite being stronger, Golza still gets its ass handed to him when Daigo goes Tiga with his combined physical and energy attacks, the Ultra proceeding to... throw him... back into the... volcano. Um... What? The volcano was what made him stronger in the first place! He won't die from that! He'll return to threaten people again! And I'm not kidding about that! In Ultraman Dyna, which is set in Tiga's continuity nine years after its end, Golza re-emerges with even more power than before, and proceeds to go on another rampage. What the hell? That's not removing the threat, that's leaving it for someone else to solve! Anyways, metal monsters begin appearing all over Tokyo, as Rena tests out a new fighter, the Snow White, which is installed with a new experimental engine, the Maxima Overdrive! Hiya! I knew I should have gotten the turbo. Unfortunately, the tests go bad, but is prevented from being cancelled by General Yoshioka, who argues against safe testing for some reason that I don't get, as it probably would be better to not lose valuable resources that would take far longer to be replaced, as opposed to a short pause on operations to confirm one's safety. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! Renna does recover, she is their best pilot after all, but after she heads back, sees a structure floating in the high atmosphere. My god, they found Laputa! Still, the callous disregard for life, not just by Yoshioka, but the drive's creator, Nanban Yao, gets under everyone's skin, Daigo trying to go talk to him, only to, by following him, discover deep under the base a large warship nearing completion and it appearing to be powered by the Maxima Overdrive. The system is one that, similar to Tiga, harnesses the power of light to generate power and propulsion. Um, that's not light. That's the energy released from the mutual annihilation present in an antimatter reaction. You just invented Star Trek's warp drive, dude! Which is ironic, as the ship is based off a whale and the Star Destroyer from Star Wars. Seriously, look it up. And when I first saw it, it honestly reminded me of Gigabytus, aka the Zenith Carrier Zord from Ginga Man and Power Rangers Lost Galaxy. Back to the robots, Guts ends up collecting them, as each time they engage one, it falls apart into an empty suit of armor. They reactivate and reconstruct themselves as part of a plan to infiltrate the base, which is something the Guts team really, really should have seen coming, considering how they appeared out of nowhere and shut down for no reason to begin with. And they're all originating from that floating landmass that simultaneously begins to attack the surface below. 
The bots, called Gobnu, are after the Ardese, necessitating the Guts team launch the ship, even in its incomplete state. The scene of its first launch is egregiously and gratuitously long, with the length of it just showcasing, yeah, these are very detailed models, and we're showing you that they're really detailed models, with how slowly they're moving through its first launch. To be fair, some of that could be the slowly moving through animosity to emphasize its power thematic, but it's not really succeeding if that was what they were going for. But yeah, the ship launches and makes for Sky Island, with the many, many mecha following and amalgamating into a larger mechanoid, which Tiga then has to prevent from triggering its own self-destruct, either in range of the ship, or when it tries to do the same to the base. Suffice to say, as Tiga does this while his color timer's almost dead, Daigo ends up taking a dip in the big drink by its end. And to the, add to the we-are-so-screwed levels, thousands more of the robots emerge from the island, now revealed to in fact be a massive ship. Daigo should alive, albeit adrift at sea, and experiences a vision that is right up Chiaki Kanaka's alley with regards to existential self-actualization, seeing through it the danger his teammates are in. This impressing the need for them to come together and not fight alone, as seems to have been impressed upon him. Yazumi recovers him from the ocean, the pair bringing back a metal slab from the destroyed Gestalt for his analysis. The island eventually sucks the Ardese inside of it, making Yao consider the possibility that they've been after his invention all along. Sure enough, Yazumi manages to pull a partial bot from the slab and get it to reveal it and its cohorts are part of an automated security system meant to prevent the creation of such a drive on any developing world. Why is never specified, whether the technology itself is dangerous or they're the vanguards of another species who seeks galactic domination and don't want their conquest to gain power to challenge them, well, we just have nothing. But since the mechanoids are also powered by this system and are attempting to drain power from the ship, they realize an ingenious way to escape this trap. Reverse it. Reverse what? Reverse the polarity. Sure enough, it works, and another Gobnu giant's attack is prevented from reaching the ship by the return of Tiga. But due to Daigo's injuries transplanting up to the Titan of Light, he's having a far worse time of things. Fortunately, Hori on the fly realizes they can use the Maxima Overdrive to overclock their main gun if they connect it directly to the drive, something Yao is hesitant to allow. His invention is made for the good of mankind, not to power a weapon. And the first Godzilla movie showed us that oftentimes, such as too dangerous to let people possess, as it can be misused, so... No, the best of intentions is not enough. Still, they go with it, and the Maxima Cannon does its job in blowing up the ship, with the Ardese becoming a rarely seen addition to their arsenal. In episode 21, a giant alien repeatedly attacks briefly before just as quickly disappearing, the Guts team finding that at each incident, there are a troop of performers with an odd member that's always in costume. He's a giant chicken. <gasps> yeah, it's a monster called Deben. The giant, called Inomena, is after Deben as the entity can emit energy fields that affect the brain. And Omenas, rendering them violently insane, the damage becoming permanent with time, but Dem is not only negating its field, but healing any of that damage. As such, the former has been hunting the latter to eliminate that counteracting force, and Deben has been on the run with the troop it fell in with after landing on Earth, the group having seen it and helped it out of the kindness of their hearts. And people say carnies are evil! Well, it eventually became their mascot and full member of their group, which has brought them luck, as Devin even passively just generates good vibes. While some less than scrupulous members of the TBC want to take Devin to experiments on him, the troop are not having that and run, only for Enomena to strike again, directing those it drives insane to attack Devin's friends, which forces it out into the open to counter the field, at which point Enomena strikes and mortality wounds the creature, who continues to give out its good vibes until Daigo as Tiga succeeds in breaking the means by which it generates its insanity field. But it turns out the troop pulled a con in faking Devon's death in the aftermath of the conflict to keep it out of TPC's hands. And hey, since the monster already looks like a fake suit, they can just continue to fake it being just that. 
Ah, carnies. They always have a scam going. Next, yet another meteorite. Do you get why I call this series repetitive and how it all blurs together? They just keep repeating themselves on their story setup. Anyways, this meteor comes with rolling fog and a parasitic organism that lives within said mist, which quickly comes to latch on to the various populace of the village it landed nearest. When Hori and Daigo come to investigate, the main host body shoots their ship down and raises an EM field that scrambles their ability to call back to base. They run into a woman in the abandoned village, Michiru Izaki, the Funimation subs having renamed her Mizuki, who appears to have an unusual disdain for guts. This encounter leads to... Um... I think you've got something on your neck there. We favor unreasonably huge subsidies to the Brain Slug planet. Brains! Give me your brains! We're not unreasonable. I mean, no one's going to eat your eyes. So, yeah, the trio run, eventually arguing over what to do to deal with the threat. Michiru wanting to head to a local research outpost, while Hori and Daigo want to head further down the mountain to call in Guts. As Michiru won't compromise on this, however, they split up, Daigo getting pinned by a parasite, only discover after he falls in a river that the things are hydrophobic. Wow, that is a horrible weakness to have when you're invading a planet that is 75% water. Then again, this is another tale based on a Stephen King story. Look it up, it's called The Mist. Hori and Michiru are tipped off to the same weakness after accidentally stumbling near the crash site, seeing the host body absorbing the life force of its victims, before being besieged again by them. When they make it to the outpost, however, Michiru reveals what her deal is. See, her father was one of the ones that died in episode 4, after being absorbed by the alien that attacked their ship, and ended up becoming space babies. After learning of his death, she wanted some closure and intended to come to her father's lab to say goodbye. Gotta say, she had horrible timing on that. Hori tries to jury-rig the sprinklers to go off so they would be protected from the parasites, only to end up being blindsided by one. But with assurances from Michiru, he freaking pulls the thing off his body himself before triggering the override to kill it. God damn, man. That's freaking badass. Enough time's passed to get the rest of Guts following up on the pair, which leads to the parasite amalgamating into monster form, freeing all its victims, and the destruction of the meteor it came down on, which is stockpiling its power, thus weakens it enough to get rid of it. And in the wrap-up, Michiru's dislike of Guts has waned, which results in her actually getting into a relationship with Hori off-screen. Huh. In episode 23, Guts is called into a research center that finds a cybernetic dinosaur in an iceberg. No, not that one! Well, the uncovering of these devices ends up being a precursor to an invasion, HQ being hit by an EMP launched by a species known as the Naga. as they have in turn enslaved and indoctrinated another race they uplifted from Earth in super-ancient times, the inference is this is following a theory concerning potential predecessor races leaving behind the Earth long before the rise of man. And the precursor race, that actually controls the giant cyborgs, are revealed to be... well... What? Actually, kind of a weird coincidence, two months after this episode aired, Star Trek Voyager would have an episode with some pretty similar premises, called Distant Origin. The Anolian super-revolved dinosaurs originating from Earth part of it, that is. Anyways, the two dino people activate the cyborg Tyrannos, but with no Godzilla to fight, they just go a-rampaging. And worse, Guts is prevented from battling them, as both are armed with neutron bombs. And before people think that their bombs would be inert after millions of years of just sitting there, well, many common radioactive materials are pretty long-lasting. Uranium, as the example, measures at its lowest 700 million years for a block of its loose half of its mass. 
So if they used uranium in this bomb, less than 5% of its potential fissile material would have been lost in the time frame specified in the episode. So after they activate the weapons, the Naga usurp control of them, being betrayed by their masters. Daigo saves the female of the two as Tiga, who gives their assistance in shutting the cyborgs down, with Tiga flinging the bombs at the Naga to remove them. The two dino people, with nothing left and having a dislike of humans, leave to never be seen again. To get back to the fog thing, a highly caustic mist phenomena begins to affect an isolated town, but Gut's investigation is sidelined due to a bunch of brats that throw fireworks at their car as a prank. Yeah, such a prank could have resulted in an unprepared driver crashing and dying, so I am instantly against anything these kids pull. Thing is, that kind of feels like the subversion the episode was attempting, as these brats, who are known for the shit they pull all over town, are actually the ones to see the source of the poison gases that are corroding the area. Unfortunately, their conduct leaves them with no ground to stand on, and their attempts to prove it go dismissed even when the Guts crew gives them the benefit of the doubt, because a lot of them are such shitheads. <laughs> Case in point, Hori proceeds to write off the entire phenomena as nothing more than the accumulation of fuel exhaust on the town's tunnel generating the acid. The only problem is fuel exhaust really does not work that way. Sure, it does have acidic compounds, specifically nitromethane that decomposes into nitric acid, a highly corrosive agent, which, ironically in small volumes, is actually beneficial to plant life as it facilitates nitration of the soil that encourages their growth. But it's not released in high enough volumes per vehicle to generate the acidity seen in these mists, and this region, as showcased, has nowhere near enough vehicle traffic nor general population to facilitate such an atmospheric change, as opposed to it being an industrial district where factories spewing gases into the sky constantly would be more commonplace for causing things like acid rain. Plus, the show has already said and showcased that such problems are on the decline due to recent technological developments. This is important, aside from once more being the science officer not knowing how science works, as the monster of the week that is spewing these compounds was supposedly woken up from its subterranean resting place by fuel exhaust taking a form similar to the gases it spreads, and in fact is feeding upon them! But forgetting that said cave is not only nowhere near the tunnel they then cite as the cause for collecting such pollution, but spatially below it with regards to relative sea level, while fuel exhaust rises into the air, so it would not have ever come into contact with them. You know, for a show that has its characters consistently be smart, I'm annoyed at the breaches of science does not work that way committed by the writers. And it is made worse by them saying that this entity can only live by feeding off of pollution. The episode trying to paint humanity as culpable for such crises due to their disregard for the environment, when this creature is not natural, lives in a low pollution environment, and also only emerges when such pollution is setting-wise on the decline. The episode is exceedingly contradictory in the messages it's trying to convey, as its justifications for its positions only support the opposite agenda. And yet I'd still take this over the bullcrap they tried to pull in Megaforce. Anyways, Daigo saves the brats from their own utter stupidity and assholishness when they try to prove the monster exists, while Hori formulates a strong basic compound to neutralize the beast's corrosive attacks and defenses. A xenomorph this thing is not. Honestly, because of both the brats and the uttered failure to deliver an environmental message considering the setting of the story, this is certainly one of Tiga's worst episodes. But it is not the worst. That, my friends, is coming. News reports surface of an angel appearing repeatedly in the region, which concerns Megumi as she sees her mother-in-law in some of the surveillance footage of the event. Made worse when she gets a message from her son Tomoki that, yes, Granny is close to drinking the Kool-Aid. While the rest of Guts investigates the angel's appearances as a mysterious cloud, Megumi goes to her family's home and finds that the old woman has in fact gone round the bend into a cultist, believing the angel that's coming will return Katsuhiko, 
Megumi's husband and Tomogi's father, to them. And any means of learning what's going on from her son is waylaid by Grams. Until Daigo and Rena appear to confirm that everyone that's seen the angel has had their brains soaked in detergent. Granted, Megumi didn't exactly need that to know what's going on. Her mother-in-law straight up despises her due to her being in Brazil when her husband died and not being able to be there for the family with such a posting. And the woman has prevented her from seeing Tomoki for literal years, even though I'm pretty sure parental rights should supersede any guardianship case one could make since she hasn't given up such rights, nor is legally considered a criminal or abuser who would have such rights revoked. But as a consequence, Megumi in many respects feels like she's failed as a parent to her son due to not being allowed to be in his life. And people wonder why so many kids and teens in Japanese media have parental issues if this is an admission by someone who loves their kid enough to abandon her position on the slightest chance there's something wrong. Sure enough, the angel's revealed to be a production by the Kiri, who appeared in the last episode focused on Megumi. You know, 22 episodes ago. Them taking another human host and kicking the crap out of Daigo, while proclaiming that Tiga is the true devil. Yeah, I hate to reiterate this after it only being, what, less than a month since I last brought it up, but how often in Japanese media is this trope invoked? That God is evil and the devil is truly the good guy? It's a lot. The irony of this is they're not entirely wrong. As would come to be elaborated on later in Tiga's sequel movies, he originated as an evil ultra that changed his ways after falling in love with Yuzare and became the protector of the ancient civilization, and they're not actually referencing any of that as Konaka was writing this episode while that lore expansion and retcon was penned by Keiichi Hasegawa three years after the series ended. While Hasegawa was one of Konaka's main collaborators, fans of Chiaki's work are notoriously pedantic about anything that's added onto series without his say-so. You do not want to see how bafflingly vitriolic Digimon fans get about Digimon Tamer's movie Runaway Lokomon and any possibility of treating it as canon. Despite it actually being one of the best Digimon movies, providing character-consistent backstory for Rika that wasn't able to be supplied in the main show, and Kunaka giving his seal of approval to it despite not being consulted for said movie. Apparently people prefer Tamer's post-series Ono dramas that, due to how Toei treats canon, aren't actually considered to be such. Anyways, with Daigo incapacitated, the Kirin cause a massive gate to emerge from the clouds, which heralds their invasion. Fortunately, Guts manages to rescue him, meaning Tiga is all up for preventing the gate from opening. Another Kiriloid Titan tries to in turn counter him, and that statement proves to be a bit more literal than I intended, as this Kiriloid has been modified to match Tiga's type change form for form, and Tiga is laid out prone. However, Megumi gets the idea to recharge Tiga with light energy, transmitting to everyone a request to shine light on Tiga, for he is the light that shines in the darkness. Once again, I need to get back to reviewing Garo. Well, with these encouragements, Tika manages to outfight the monster, and throws him straight into the door, the camaraderie of humanity breaking the spell on them and punching the big damn reset button. The reset button gets pushed a lot in this show, which I will showcase more of next week. See you there!